KOW. Okay, so hi, Collier. So just hi, Michael. To anybody who does not know who's Collier or who's Michael, so Collier Shore, who has an exhibition now at KOW in KOW Gallery in Berlin. And I'm Michael Clegg from Clegg and Gutmann. And the show is going to be over in a few days. So as a kind of a finissage, we want to talk a bit about the show, and a bit about the period that we met each other in New York, and at the end about the collab collaborative project that we've done together, collaborative project. So Colin, I wanted to ask you first about, uh, I guess this is the first time this show is exhibited out uh, in Germany, where you actually made the pieces, where you photographed them in the 90s, right? Right, so yeah. The question that I had in mind is, how do you think it actually affects the understanding? Or how, uh, how would you assume that the work looks different in a context that we're less familiar with or understanding a bit, a bit less as the dress of codes and the kind of nuances of presentation and particularly, I suppose, in the gay community are really different from country to country. So one kind of loses control, I suppose, about the nuances of um, the codes or the meaning of particular positions. So yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting for me to look at it because I'm reminded of um, something that Stephen Shore said uh, a long time ago, that if you take a photo and you put it in a drawer for 20 years, when you take it out, it's inherently more interesting because it carries nostalgia and, um, and the change of style makes it appealing just for the fact that it's a kind of talisman from another time. But when I look at these pictures, I think there was something, um, in a way, I was looking for something very generic. Um, you know, the clothing, the Levi's, the sweat socks, I think he has a belt on, the hairstyle. In some ways, I think it's not, it doesn't really look like it's from another time. It more looks like it's timeless. Um, and for me, I think the, what's interesting is when I made that work there, the discussion of gender was sort of bound up, I think in um, gay male identity in art and also AIDS activism. And so it almost is a full circle to the period now where people are so much more interested in gender and fluidity. There's so many more terms um, that the pictures in some way seem normalized in a way that maybe I was trying to provoke the landscape in 1992. Mm -hmm. And now it seems like it could actually just be a document. Yeah, well, I was thinking a bit more, I think it's a really good point about the changing that inevitably work changes. Uh, we often experience it or think about it in the context of monuments where we try to make our public sculpture always for a very limited time, simply knowing that the circumstances around it change. So the work is constantly uh, in transition in a way in terms of its meaning. So my thought was more, let's say, if you look at the, what you refer to as kind of generic American um, elements in the dress, uh, the, the code of dresses, dressing, uh, I would say that perhaps here it's more like thinking or symbolizes the relation to the United States, right? That one looks like they participate from Germany in another culture, right? That it's not, yes. uh, it's robbed of a certain, let's say naturalness or obvious quality that uh, you would have in the United States. It has immediately a kind of a reference. So my, my thinking was really more about this transition, the shift in con context that when something is right. shown in a place that we are limited, I think we talked the other day about the fact that um, it's interesting and, and very liberating in some ways to work in a country that you, one does not understand it perfectly. Uh, in my case, I have a limit. My German is, is not fluid. I even choose perhaps uh, not to uh, <clears throat> to speak German. So um, when we photograph people here, uh, we we if, especially if they're politicians or people who have a public image, 
we, we don't have a complete understanding of who they really are. And that in some ways allows us to actually represent them. So this is a little bit, uh, I guess also one can think about the text that you've written about this, or you refer to Germany as the empty country, or for you, it was a kind of a contextless place to enter into. Yeah, I think that, you know, my whole, uh, I, I invented a space in this town. And as long as I was in that town, I experienced, uh, you know, these stages. One was total Auslander, um, an occupier. You know, I went to a country that had so much history for me before I came to it, you know, because I would see so many things uh, in school from, you know, film footage from the Holocaust. And, you know, we we're very educated in a specific way. And then I went to the small German town and it was occupied by the US Army. So I felt very safe in a place that historically wasn't safe. And I felt very entitled. And, and after years and years and years of making pictures there, I sort of experienced the Stockholm syndrome in which I became very sympathetic and empathetic. And um, my entitlement changed from, I'm entitled to take what I want uh, to I'm entitled to be here, live here, be a participant, be German, to assume a kind of German identity and therefore um, be a German artist. You know, and, and, and we talked about, I think, the lineage of German photography and, and both of our, our interest in Dusseldorf School and, and the way that August Sanders' work sort of, you know, informed so many generations of photography I think precisely because it had such a wide, you know, agenda in terms of describing and also, you know, really used a lot of genre. Um, and so I think we each kind of went in and took some of that. And for me, you know, it, after the initial kind of gender work, I, I made army pictures, I made soldier pictures. So um, in the beginning, it was very much like a vulner, creating a vulnerable figure and putting him in a landscape that I had only really seen in Holocaust films and Gursky and Struth, mm -hmm. um, you know, and Ruth and, and those guys, but mostly Gursky, I think, you know, just seeing that countryside that seemed like it was without breath. And what I wanted to do was put a breathing thing in the landscape because my encounter with southern Germany was that it was very much soft and and in, in a way inviting. Well I think working in, in contexts that are less familiar to us allows us kind of freedom frees us from the difficulties that we have to produce work in places that we understand perhaps too well. It provides a space of fantasy and projection that perhaps one does not have in other uh, <clears throat> more familiar places. But you were saying before, and it's an interesting point that the work started in New York in relation to the politicization with, with AIDS. And of course, I think for many of us, that was a, a, a moment kind of an awakening call. And for some artists it was also a decision to really not leave the art field altogether, but change people like Greg Bordowitz yeah, to, to really actually produce work within ACT UP as his primary mode of making work. So maybe we can digress for a minute and go back to, to this period in New York that is hard to really understand right now when, when really AIDS was uh, so much kind of clustered around marginalization. Yeah? Perhaps, perhaps I guess with the corona, one could say that it's also to a degree when it's um, Blacks and Hispanics are kind of, or all the people are associated with that. So let's say the burden of these numbers is perceived differently. But let's talk for a minute about this period uh, yeah. that you started to make them in New York and the political changes there. I think, I mean, it's, it's almost hard to believe how uh, united and fractured we were as an art world. So, I mean, just as an example, uh, you know, I was coming off of an education, uh, you know, through appropriation, 
So we weren't taught the Dusseldorf School at SVA in, in 1983. We were taught Richard Prince and Cindy Sherman and Barbara Kruger and Sherry Levine. So there was one kind of conceptual framework about not making pictures. And then what was coming in on the other side was, you know, AIDS activism work and David Warner of it. And, you know, and I went to school with Greg Bordowitz. Uh, so I was, you know, very close to, to him and, and the way in which he shifted as an artist um, during, during the AIDS era. But there was also this idea of, uh, you know, Jack Pearson and Mark Morris Rowe and Nan Golden. So there was like one school of thought that was saying, you don't have to make a picture to make a picture. And there was another group of people that were somehow making pictures. Um, and this all happened at the same time. And I think for me, until I went to Germany and started making work, I was in this appropriation mode and I was talking about gender and I was talking about lesbian visibility um, in, in direct relation to David Warnerovit, who uh, you know, was making work I really responded to, but it wasn't about my identity. And then when I went to Germany, it was almost as though I brought the permission to make pictures um, because I could infiltrate a landscape that belonged to another art group that I was suddenly exposed to. And so it was really a kind of perfect storm of, I remember thinking like, I wanted to make a Larry Clark picture, but I wanted to make it in a European kiddie porn atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And I had never seen European kiddie porn. I just imagined that that's what it looked like. And, and I did this with my girlfriend at the time's nephew. So it was, it was really a lot of land grabbing and it was all to kind of make something that brought together everything in New York I'd been thinking about, but I had a very strong sense that what I was making in Germany would not be at all acceptable in Germany. And, and was it so? What was your impression yes. of how New York was made? Where did you show it first? I showed it at 303. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, you know, for me, the, the thing of looking back at that work is that I, I didn't know very much about photography technically. And so I have certain emotional feelings about what's happening in that work because of my limitations, the limitations of the time, the technology. Um, but I, you know, and I think I wrote this in the press release, I carried a lot of um, and maybe it's necessary, necessary aggression to uh, Germany. It's just that what happened is I loved, I began to love Germany, German people, the land, my place in this town. And I really began to also increasingly dislike the German art establishment because I felt that I was making something that was uh, in earnest conversation with the lineage of photography and I couldn't understand why that wasn't interesting. You know, I don't think I've ever been in, in texts or kunst mm -hmm. ever, you know. Uh, but do you think that your work is understood differently in Germany or do you have any, any sense of how it's been seen here? I mean, I always felt like it was the kind of thing that someone would just, you know, instantly turn away from like, you know, the combination of like gay pictures and Nazi pictures mm -hmm. and romantic pictures and pictures that romanticize gay and Nazi just seems like, uh, you know, a poem that a German would say can't be translated into German. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. you know, I forgot that we have, uh, we downloaded before from the site of uh, uh, one or two of the pictures. So let, let me just open them so we can look. If one of them as we speak. Um, yeah, hopefully this yep. is on in full screen. So this is um, it, it's really fascinating the, the what how uh, you refer and, and kind of enlarge the context in a way that um, I guess it's a matter of uh, familiarity with the work and allowing oneself to explore certain content that uh, 
it's always to me a question how able we are as artists to really look and involve ourselves with the work of others. Is the market in some ways is always pushing us to look at each other as competitors. And in as much as we can resist these pressures, we are nevertheless uh, kind of bound and enslaved by them. I think it's difficult to resist the group that we had in the, in the 90s, Parasite in, in New York, kind of attempted to really uh, simply have artists look at each other's work and really attentively listen to what the other does. And now that you speak about it, about your work, I'm kind of reminded how, how rare it is for me actually to have conversations that are really about somebody else's work and to really listen to them and to allow myself to discover content that uh, I wasn't attentive to, to before. And so the, the difficulty that we have to interact or, or become audience to each other. Yeah. Maybe, I, maybe that's not meant to be. But. Well, you know, we were, um, we met in New York at, uh, at a certain time where I was, I was looking at your work in more in a way that you're looking at my work now. I was able to look at your work as someone who had yet to make very much art. And so you were an established artist, you and Martin, and, and I was very drawn to your work. And I almost had a sense, like for me, I completely connected you with, you know, what was going on in Dusseldorf, but I felt it was much more, uh, it had much more of a conceptual edge and it was much more um, honest, I think, in, in discussing anxiety. I, I felt the anxiety was on the table in your work. And it was also, you know, in some ways, because you had the photographic backdrop and you were photographing people that might be real, but you were almost giving them a theatrical um, presence. You know, so if you look at a Struth portrait of two art dealers and you look at, uh, you know, your portrait of Clarissa and Nicole from Cable Gallery, they felt different because, I mean, it's a longer discussion, but I remember spending the time with your work and and being really intrigued and, and it taking a long time for me to understand that you were not German and therefore you were outside um, of that system. And I think, you know, in New York, there was a point in which I was working at 303 Gallery, I was working for Richard Prince and I was working for Peter Halley. And, and I remember a dynamic in which all of the artists could travel from, you know, a group show at Nature Mort with a lot of young conceptual artists and then go to a sauna Ben dinner for another artist who was making a lot of money. And it was almost like um, we were a perfect utopia, you know, from the perspective of someone who was young and, and working for other people. It was this utopia where you could be conceptual and you could, you could wear nice clothes and go to a dinner and eat nice food. And some people had more money. Yeah. But they all but, depended on each other. Mm -hmm. There was a refusal to see. Uh, this is my dog coughing, by the way. If you hear this bizarre sound yes. behind me, but uh, I think there was a refusal to really see a, a, any contradiction in, in between, you know, the East Village and the Ilianas on the Benjamins, for that matter. Meaning, they thought that you could do art that looked very attractive and very well finished, and uh, was also indeed often expensive and yet to retain the critical edge and ability to bite the collectors who supposedly unbeknown were unbeknown to the to its critical content bought it so this was i think a common idea really in the 80s that maybe the second half of the 80s and the period that we're talking about is a bit later um i guess we're, you started to make work in the 90s right is that i started to make work in I was the last show at Cable Gallery before they closed. Oh. And that was where I, I curated a group show at 303 with Greg Bordowitz and Mark Dion on Andrea Frazier, Sylvia Kowalski. Um, I did it with Fareed Armley at mm -hmm. the time. And I put my work in, which I had never made work before, but it, there was a hole in the, you know, the sense of like what was being discussed. And so I made lesbian work. And, and then I showed it at Cable 
in a group show, a three person show, and and then finally their last show. And I think that must have been in eighty nine or eighty eight. And I was I was completely, uh, you know, I I tell people I I didn't study art. I studied journalism. I had no skills to be an artist. I I didn't imagine being an artist. I was only an artist because there was something not being said in an art world that talked about so many things. Mm-hmm. And and you could in those days not necessarily have skills, but you could cobble together, you know, something based on what you had to say. And I, I'm not sure if that exists today, but it was because also you, you know, I had no sense of a career or selling work. I wasn't doing it for that. I was just doing it to have speech. Mm-hmm. No, it's a fascinating chronology. Uh, I guess I didn't see it because at that point we'd already left cable gallery and we kind of felt uh, too awkward or, or to, to return yeah. to the place. But um, surely it's a really interesting discussion to think about this chronology of the 80s, from the 80s to the 90s that start maybe with Richard Prince and, uh, and the kind of shifts that occur in it. And uh, there's certainly a lot to talk about. Um, maybe, meanwhile, I, I, turn, I turn here very slowly another picture, a black and white photograph. I wanted to ask you, what is the size of the, of the pictures? Uh, this one, I think, is, is a bit bigger, like uh, maybe it's 20 by 24 or 16 by 20. It originally, there's a color version that was quite large, you know, more along the scale of your work. And, um, and that was just really poorly printed and faded. I mean, it's a real, you know, coming in touch with your work uh, when it wasn't kind of prepared perfectly. And so I made this picture because I I didn't want to depend on the lipstick. In some ways, I wanted the lipstick to be a slower reveal. Um, yeah, so it's it's called The Castle. Mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, when I when I made this particular picture, I really thought about I thought about Truffaut a lot, and that weirdly, and that's where Day for Night came in. This idea that I could make night pictures and day pictures, and essentially the night pictures could just be, you know, poorly printed, and they would appear to be night, and therefore it would give them some like allure of like, you know, cruising in Central Park or something, which is not really that clear, but. Um, I was also thinking about uh, the wild child and, you know, this idea of of someone being raised outside in nature. Um, And in some ways that gay youth has always been the wild child. It's always been something that's crawling around at nighttime outdoors, you know, looking for attachment and looking for for safety. And so... um, and then call it the castle. Yeah, escaping to the tree house here, or to the tree as a, as a place of, of being in your own territory. It almost looks though a negative positive. That's another effect of the, the night for them. You know, the, the, the picture looks yeah. like it would be flipped or, yeah. Um, but um, we talked before, and maybe we can, we can, we, we kind of decided that we'll have a short conversation and it's, difficult to do because there's a lot that we can talk about and that we can continue outside of the framework of this um, short video that we're making. But um, so perhaps in conclusion, we can look at the piece that we've done together in the collaborative piece that we've done in 86. I'm gonna search for it, it's here. And I suspect, I'm trying to remember the occasion I'm quite sure that Martin, I, I, I'm kind of trying to remember to what degree I was actually involved in making this particular piece. And if it wasn't Martin who photographed it. Do I think it was him? Martin. Yeah, I, I think so. I also kind of, uh, I mean, we have very established guidelines of how we do things. And I often find, we always find each other speaking about the other's work as though it's their own and it's ours at any rate. But one tends to, Appropriate, but I thought it would be, of course, um, we are we are missing Martin, who's, who's at the moment living in Vienna and, and teaching there. Um, so I'm going to look at the picture, which we 
misplaced there somewhere, but hopefully we can find it soon. Do you remember any, maybe you can say something? Yeah, I mean, I remember, uh, mm -hmm. I remember um, going to a very small apartment in the East Village and my best friend at the time was assisting Martin, Daphne Fitzpatrick, an artist. That's right, yeah. And so Daphne was there and Martin was there and we, we uh, I, th I feel like we were making a picture based on an existing photograph of someone standing next to a bust. And um, we got this head from Lisa Spellman. I mean, the whole thing seems so uh, ludicrous that it even happened, like how we got the bust, um, you know, when Martin showed me a picture and said, should we make this picture? Um, and I think I was very aware of the picture that you had made young man with a club maybe mm -hmm. it was the blonde boy with the two by four right. we in his hand yeah yeah the cripple and you know in a way that that's a that's who i looked for in germany when i first went to germany like mm -hmm. i saw that boy as a kind of perfect um perfect failure of masculinity mm -hmm. and i knew that this picture was about trying to uh really capture uh, you know, an escape from gender, an escape from my gender, and um, but to also capture the softness. So we made the picture, and you know, at this point, I had little kind of physical confidence, but I had a sense of strength of being gay and wearing suits and ties to openings, and um, you know, the fantasy that was like kind of pushed into this picture. Um, I think it was about, for me, being a gay man or a gay youth. So it, it, it was a bit, you know, predates this picture, the pictures of Horst in Germany. It was like trying to, and when I made those pictures of Horst in Germany, I was trying to make a better me. You know, I was trying to make a successful me. And I was, in a sense, punishing him for, you know, having the privilege of masculinity, but I think in this picture, I felt that I was, you know, your work in some ways was so aspirational. I think that, you know, the heightened, it was either people who had power and you made them look evil or too powerful, or it was someone that didn't have power and you elevated their power. But what I find so interesting is it's something, it's like called portrait of a youth with a bust. Yes. And of course a bust is also a breast. Um, and so this youth is kind of missing the breast and the sort of fine art object is actually this kitschy Elvis. Um, and the I'm sure- The is also genderless in a way, of course, yeah. And it's totally genderless. And I later actually remade this picture um, for a fashion project for re-edition magazine with um, a model that looked like me. There was literally a model walking around Europe and people would tell me, there's a girl who's modeling that looks like you. And we finally met. And in fact, she was a sort of beautiful version of me. And so we made a whole series of pictures after pictures of me from the 80s. And so one of them was this picture. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. What, yeah, in a way, thinking what you're saying now makes me think about uh, this idea of making your own work, but within the work of of another artist. And that's really the meaning of, of uh, making collaborations. And uh, of course, a, a procedure here is to share the content and to uh, have kind of equal opportunity to, to both sides. What we completely do not allow, so to speak, to the collector or to the people who commission our work, meaning that we have full control of the representation of every aspect. And here it's uh, it's shared completely and, and uh, Looking at your work before, one can of course see the content that you were addressing and speaking about, reflecting in a way, coming through our own work and in this picture, and that of course makes it um, it's a really interesting uh, way of, of. I mean, I, I've uh, we've actually not talked about this before, although we had the occasion to do so. so well, I think we we called it a collaboration, but you know, I think I think photographers. Uh, you know, a painter would never 
John Kern might say that he has a muse in his wife, but I don't think he says it's a collaboration. I think photographers sort of know that it's a collaboration because the there's a subject that's alive in the work. And but but there is a sense of like how we how we take them. So when we made this work, I had emotions of like, I'm making a collaborative work. And in fact, this work wouldn't exist without all of my history and ideas, but it lives in your work. And, you know, in the end, all I wanted for all this time, and I'm finally getting it, was to own it, to have it um, as a proof of my specialness that I was in something. And, uh, you know, as a photographer, that has done a lot of, um, you know, projects with certain people so that they're in the work a lot. There's, there's a kind of, um, you know, there's a, a very interesting territory and it's at its most successful when the person has such a desire to be pictured, has such a desire to be in the picture that in fact they are, it, it, for them it's a very equal trade that they can let the work be mine. But of course the photographers, you know, it's, it's in a way playing in some kind of relationship where you hope the person won't leave you and take themselves with them, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, now after what, more than 30 years, it, I'll be sending you the picture. It, maybe it will be a way of you, to, as you said, to hang it, but to simply enter more clearly and purposefully into your own work as it could be exhibited, as it is seen now at QW. But um, it, uh, it clearly gives it, uh, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> gives me, of course, at the moment, the possibility one thinks about the idea of having collaborative work where you actually show the work of both sides, of both artists, and to see how an image can actually function uh, or struggle for, for meaning in different ways or have two different contents that, uh, can be seen in, in the perhaps the word struggle uh, provide and kind of points to a conflict, but uh, that need not necessarily be. So good, what do you think? I guess we can end at this point. Yeah, I wondered if, do you yeah. think that um, what's so funny about this piece, of course, is that it's the collaboration, but it's just my first name. And I was wonder, I was thinking, oh, is it because it was titled that like when you did a piece with David Robbins, did it say David Robbins or David? Uh, well, it didn't at all, actually. I mean, no. as a matter of fact, I looked at, at one catalog and it said um, collaboration with uh, a youth with a bus. And then sometimes it even says in brackets Elvis and sometimes it says Patrice as well. Right. But um, typically we don't include the names. Yeah, even when it's a something with a collaboration, we just point to who the collaboration is with to kind of emphasize it. But very often it has the, the, the title itself. And this is really following more the work uh, that we do when we photograph people who are from the art world. So they are really standing as actors who play themselves in a sense. So right. they're kind of robbed of the ability to be, to, to, uh, to be presented with their own name. Of course, when they hang the piece in their own home, that completely shifts away. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they re-own their own image, so to speak. But there's always a struggle between the private and the public as far as the meaning and identification of those two. But, it's just um, interesting because, um, you know, Patrice is my first name and Collier is my middle name. And so when I see Patrice, I immediately think, ah, yes, this was before because it's true, this was before I was myself. This is when my identity was more tied up in A, being young and B, working for other people and people who met me, met me through those places, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but it does make sense, I suppose, to, if one wants to emphasize the, the dual logic and the collaborative aspect of the work is to really have, uh, a portrait of a youth with a bust, hips in brackets to say Elvis, and then to add a uh, collaboration with Collier Shaw. Yeah, I mean, only, you know, if it's, yeah. if it's of interest, I think it's yeah. so clear that it's, 
you know, it carries this picture is so amazing because in some ways it is my work before my work, mm -hmm. you know, because there's so much of me in my work. I just look at it and I think it might as well just say, you know, a Jew. Like mm -hmm. I look at it and I just think it's so Jewish. There's something like so heroically and vulnerably Jewish. And I think that that was the connection I felt with Martin, mm -hmm. um, you know, that we were, we were Jewish and I went into Germany as a Jew and, and, um, and I always felt that I was an outsider, but I think that that's precisely why I could make the work that I made. If I wasn't, I wouldn't make that work. And it was never my, um, it was never my choice to have that work accepted in Germany. It's, it's, and, and of course, you know, would I have wanted to make a more uh, prescriptive, mild work in Germany that catered to a German audience? No. So I'm, I'm quite satisfied. Yeah, well, I think we're never in control about as far as where our work is perceived and, and liked. And in a way, we, we, we follow the places where it is exhibited. In a way, it's enforced yeah, on, on us in some ways. But I think. Um, Part of the, of course, the Jewish identity is to feel the kind of built-in alienation that one feels that perhaps in Germany is even stronger. That one is in a place that one always feels a kind of a resonance of foreignness and uh, what was then, and, and never a complete ability to to feel comfortable or at home. The word home is kind of divorced from yeah. this context, although it's an intellectual home in many ways. Yeah. But can I add one thing, just because I think it's it's really interesting. I had, um, you know, earlier I, I did some projects with Barbara Weiss Gallery, and I had the opportunity to have a visit with Barbara and Casper Kuning one year. And, and I remember Barbara looking at my books uh, of pictures from Schwäbisch Gmund and being very emotional and talking about being homesick for Germany, homesick for her childhood. Um, and I thought, ah, oh, this is really the reason that the work is complex for Germans, because nostalgia is so complex for Germans. And there's very little opportunity to indulge in nostalgic yearning. And I think my work just is too, it provokes too many complicated feelings, or it did. Um, you know, because I know that the people that I photographed and the adults, the parents of those kids, all had very nostalgic feelings about the pictures and that the, a woman could look at a picture of her grandson, you know, taken that year, that summer in a Nazi uniform. And I gave her permission for them to have a memory that they had taken out of their photo album, you know, in the seventies. So it's interesting. Yeah. There's a whole history of course, of Jews being able to present Germanness to Germany. Yeah, to be kind of super German in, in a sense to precisely because of their alienation is uh, they have an extra measure of wanting to be assimilated and therefore internalized. Uh, of course, if one thinks about the whole culture in, in Vienna or in Berlin before the war and the, the Jewish has to be that gives a whole other uh, trajectory, a whole other subject to, to, uh, to the meaning of working today as people who either in our case growing up in Israel or yours growing up in the United States as Jews. So good, I guess we end here. We can go on and perhaps we will yep. go on, but we'll tell Rafael to turn it off. But thanks, yes. anyhow. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah. I really appreciate yeah. it. Um, and thanks, Rafael and KOW. Ciao. Bye-bye. Hmm.